Our next speaker is Professor Prabal Roy Chowdhury. And starting here, we are now looking into India as regions, like clusters. And we are starting to kind of look at it. Throughout the day today, we will see uh, the region of Bengal, followed by Orissa, and there is a talk to ta look at uh, Tamil Nadu. And Mr. Harikarta is here with us. And he's going to give us a good perspective of Kerala. We try to move it to tomorrow. So we are now looking at clusters of India that make up the Bharatvash. Okay. Thank you very much for inviting me here. Uh, since we are deliberating on things Indian, I'd like to start with a small invocation. Mannatha Shri Jagannatha Madguru Shri Jagadguru Mamatma Sarva Bhutatma Tasmai Shri Gurave Nama. Um, my pranams uh, to all our friends and elders present here. So before we go into the actual history of Bengal, which is very difficult to, for me to cover in around 30 minutes, I would like to present a small premise. For me, <clears throat> it is always that the ancients held that the highest form of knowledge is self-knowledge, and that he who achieves that knowledge achieves it all. It seems to me that the value of self-knowledge holds good for nations as well. No matter how one defines a nation, and it has not been found easy to do so, it is, uh, in essence, seems to lie not in its outward attributes, but in the mental world of those who comprise it. Of the ingredients of this inner world, the most important is self-image, that is, the image that the people comprising a nation have of themselves and their forefathers. During the British rule, the needs of imperialistic rule dictated that Indians be pictured as an inferior people in respect to material, moral, and intellectual accomplishments. This deliberate denigration of the Indian nation was furthered by the incapacity of the foreigner to understand properly a civilization so different from his own. So, in course of time, as our political subjugation became complete, we happened to accept as real the distorted image of ourselves that we saw in the mirror the British held to us. Not a small part of the psychological impetus that our freedom movement received was from the few expressions of appreciations that happened to fall from the pens or lips of Western scholars about Sanskrit literature, Indian philosophy, arts or sciences. Sometimes these foreign opinions about past Indian achievements were seized upon and inflated out of all proportions so as to feed the slowly emerging national ethos. After the first few years of euphoria since independence, a period of self set in of self deligration in which educated Indians, particularly those educated in the West, took the lead. Whether in the name of modernization, science or technology, they ran down most, if not all, things Indian. We are not yet out of this period. I am not suggesting that what is wrong and evil in Indian society or history should be glossed over, but breast beating and self flagellation are not conducive to the development of those psychological drives that are so essential for nation building, nor so is slavish imitation of others. Now, coming back to Bengal. Bengal holds a very special position in the socio-cultural, religious, spiritual, and political landscape of India. What strikes to most of us today, even today, is Bengal's outstanding contribution to free Indian freedom movement and contemporary art and literature. However, unfortunately, nothing much is ever discussed in our textbooks on the ancientness of the civilization that flourishes in this part of the country. The reason for such a lacuna is definitely not lack of source materials or substantive evidence, but perhaps laziness and insincerity on our part. And we are all to be blamed for that. It is high time that we stop looking at the mirror held by the West and start working on our own. So, quoting Professor Balaganga Dharain from We Shall Not Cease from Explorations, so we know the West as the West looks at itself. We study the East the way the West studies the East. We look at the world the way the West looks at it. 
We do not even know whether the world would look different if we looked at it our way. Today we are not in a position even to make sense of the above statement. When Asian anthropologists, I will change the word Asian to Indian, Indian anthropologists or sociologists or culturologists do their anthropology, sociology or culturology, the West is really talking to itself. Now, I'm not a historian, but from the layman's perspective, if I look at the history of Bengal, I would love to periodize it like this. I would love to have one for the pre-Buddhistic Bengal, taking Buddha, and obviously going by the chronology that Vedvir Aryaji, Shri Vedvir Aryaji suggested to us yesterday, pre-Buddhistic Bengal, post-Buddhistic Bengal. And then we come to Shashanka, the ruler of Bengal. We'll come to him a little later and his successors. Then we come to uh, the coming of Islam and the subjugation of Bengal, the continued rule of Islam in Bengal. Amidst Islamic rule, you have the local Hindu potentates, and they helped in the survival of Bengali culture. Then Bengal's tryst with the great goddess, the age of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, and revival of Bengali cultural fortunes. Continuation of Islamic rule in Bengal amidst local rebellions, we slowly come down to the uh, Pathans, the Mughals, and the Nawabi period. Then comes the Europeans. Then we have the British conquest of Bengal and the second colonization. We call the Islamic conquest the first colonization and the British conquest the second colonization. Then we have the despoliation and defaming of Bengal. But then we see new light, new horizon. Sri Ramakrishna, we have him as an Acharya for modern times. We slowly move for political emancipation, divided Bengal through India's partition, but resulting in a continued Hindu Holocaust. So coming to the first great king of Bengal in the historical period, we come to Raja Shashanka. Shashanka was the ruler of Bengal. He ruled from Gaura, he was not just a political unifier, but he was a unifier of the society. He was a contemporary of Harshavardhana, who was then the emperor of Karnauj, uh, and Vaskarabarman. Vaskarabarman was the ruler of Kamrupa, the, more or less the present day Assam. His capital was at Karnasuvarna, somewhere near the Murshidabad region. And the credit of the Bengali calendar, Bangabda, goes to Shashanka and not to Akbar that many have claimed. The reference to Shonar Bangla, literally the land that yields gold, is to Shashanka's reign. Shashanka, after Shashanka's period, you have the rule of fish, Matsanya in Bengal, very difficult times. But Bengal is pulled out of these difficult times with the coming of, of the Palas. It is generally assumed, popularly assumed, that the Palas and the Senas were both from the south. They were from Dakshinatya. The Palas were imperial rulers during the post-classical period with their original base out of Bengal, sometimes out of Gauda. They ruled for about 400 years, between 750 and 1150 CE. They were known for their military strategy and diplomatic skills. There is a lot of discussion on the Indian Ocean region. Why is there only one ocean in the whole world which is named after a country? There is not much discussion, similar discussion, on the Bay of Bengal region. If I recollect correctly, uh, Nalanda University today has started a center to study the Bay of Bengal region. So. It, the Palas established suzerainty over the Bay of Bengal region, and they did it with uh, great success. The Palas were succeeded by the Senas, and amongst the Senas, you have Ballala Sena, who was very most famous king of this dynasty. He ruled from Gauda, and Ballal's territory, you have the five divisions of Bengal, the Panchabhukti, Vanga, Marendra, Kamarupa, Rara and Mithila. Uh, some assume that ben, uh, during his time, uh, uh, Ballal's territory was as far as at times to stretch beyond Delhi and Punjab regions also. But at this stage, I would like to take you to a bit of macro history. We generally tend to gloss over macro histories 
but macro histories provide us with powerful narratives. So just perhaps between uh, the Palas and the Senas, there was a local governor of uh, the Bengal region, Adishura. He made an effort to re-establish Sanatana Brahmanya Dharma in Bengal region because uh, he wanted, he was a Brahmin from the south and he did not obviously want the high seat that Buddhism was occupying in the society. So he wanted the re-establishment of Vaidika, Jnana Kanda and Karma Kanda in Bengal. So he brought in five Brahmanas and five Kayasthas from Kanauja. These five Brahmanas were Bhattanarayana of Shandilya lineage, Daksha of Kashyapa lineage, Sri Harsha of Bharadwaja lineage, Vedagarva of Savarna lineage, and Chanda of Vatsya lineage. We have given their modern day surnames here. You would see uh, Banerjee, Chatterjee, Mukherjee, Gangulis, and all that. So they still populate the whole of the Bengal region, largely Brahmanas. Along with them came the five Kaistas, Makaranda Ghosh, Dasharatha Basu, Purushottam Datta, Virata Guha, Kalidas Mitra. So when I went to Sri Aurobindo's house in Calcutta, Aurobindo Bhavan, there I was very, uh, you know, happy to see from Makaranda Ghosh, they had traced Sri Aurobindo's genealogy. So, uh, well, I just wanted to say, Ballal Sena was a great social reformer also. He uh, brought in a system of nobility, uh, nobility not in the sense of the European nobility, but nobility in the sense of gunas. He brought in in Bengal and he classified Acharo Vinayo Vidya Pratishtha Tirtha Darshanam Nishtha Vritti Tapahadanam Navadha Kula Lakshanam. Nine qualities of head and heart. Achara, Vinaya Vidya, Tatishtha, Titta Darshanam, Nishtha, Vritti, Tapaha, and Dhanam. These are the nine qualities of head and heart. If you have these nine qualities, you become a Kulina. Nothing to do with birth. So then you have, during the Sena period, during the time of Lakshmana Sena, you have the great uh, Turkish invasion of Bengal led by Bhaktiar Khalji. It happens between 1198 and 1205 CE. And we have details from Minhazas Tapkat i Nasiri and later also from Badawni's Muntakab ut Tariq. So, this was the beginning of iconoclasm, monotheism, and colonization in Bengal. When Bhaktiar came to Bengal, he ran over three sacred sites Nalanda. Vikramshila and Odantapura. He captured gold, he ran over gold, but the saga did not stop here. You see, I have listed about seven sites whose Adina Masjid is obviously a temple to Shiva, Adinath, the Eklaki Masjid, Chika, Husin Shai Darga, Kurumberagar Masjid, Motichur, Suravati. It is not an exhaustive list but this is happening in Bengal for over the next 800 years. And Suravardi Udyan is where the Ramana Kali temple existed in Dhaka. This is the latest addition to the list. Now, something interestingly is happening. You see, even before Islam gets a strong foothold in the rest of India, Islam gets a very strong foothold in the Punjab and the Bengal region. Whereas in the rest of India, it is the rich the landed people who convert. In Bengal and Punjab, it is the local population who were converting for reasons we do not know. And then with the Bhakti movement, with Guru Nanak Dev coming and Sri Chaitanya coming, there is a stem, there is a stop in this conversion. That's why half of these two regions are converted. The other half is left for us. So Sri Chaitanya stopped, Guru Nanak stopped. But something unique happened with the Sikhs after Guru Nanak. In 200 years, they became a political power that cannot be reckoned with. Here, we, Bengal, we failed. Huh. And another thing I missed out, Bhaktiar Kelji conquered Bengal. He was very happy. Lot of silver. Bengal was rich in silver bullions. We traded with the Arakansas. He went into Assam. But the Ahoms did not leave him. If you allow me, I'll quote a shloka from Chandi where Devi says, Yuddha yagge shayam shumbham nishumbham cha hanishyachi. So, um, 
Bakhtiar Khilji was routed out by the arms and he was running for his life when his servant murdered him. So <clears throat> the rule of Islam in Bengal is not even the genocide that happened and what happened to an indigenous people, their culture and civilization has not even been documented as a footnote to world history. But it goes to the credit of the local Hindu potentates and because of them, they, the unsung heroes of Bengal, they kept alive the torch of culture and the march of Bengali Hindu civilization and its identity. So it will be grave injustice if we do not recollect a few names here. Raja Ganesha, Raja Danuja Mardan. Raja Ganesha is credited with the reintroduction of Sanskrit. Danuja Mardan, Ganesha, and Ruddha Narayana, they all declared themselves independent of Muslim rule. Then you have the great Rani Bhavani, Rani Bhavashankari, and all that. But here as a Bengali, I feel tempted to mention to you about Bengal's tryst with the great goddess, Durga. So with the subjugation of the local Hindu kings, they lost their rights to be a sovereign. They forfeited their rights to perform any kind of Vedic rituals. So the Puranas said, Ashwam, if you want to get the same phala, the same fruits that kings of your obtained out of celebrating or conducting Ashwamedha, you should conduct Sharadiya Mahapuja, Durga Puja. And you should conduct it every year. So it started. And the first Smritikaras from the Bengal region was Shrikar, Jikan, and Balak. Unfortunately, their Smritis, Nivandas are lost to time. Then you have the great Jimudvahana and Chulapani. Following them, you have from Mithila Vidyapati. Vidyapati is very clear. He says, Atha Mithila Dishwara Rup Narayana Maharaja Dhiraja Dhirasimha Deva Nam Anugaya. I am writing this text for his Durga Puja. Then you have Smartha Ragunandan Bhattacharya. And the tradition goes on. By the time, I'll show you in the next slide, that Trithivasa is Ramayana, writing his, you know, uh, Ramayana in Bengali, one of the first to be written in any regional languages, Kritivasa is deviating from Valmiki Ramayana. He is borrowing the story of Bhavishya Purana and he is saying that Rama invoked, performed Sharatkale Mahapuja and he got blessings of Devi before he went to war and thus he killed Rama. So what we ha see happening now is in the age of Sri Chaitanya. Before we go into the age of Sri Chaitanya, I would like to draw your kind attention to a place called Nadia, Navadvipa, very famous place. It's at the confluence of Navadvipa, new land, or nine islands coming together, forming a new land. So here, this is very famous because this is the birthplace of Navinaya, one of the systems of Indian philosophy. But <coughs> before Sri Chaitanya came or Jagannath Mishra migrated from Barendra to Gouda, Navadvipa was a very famous place. Navadvipa's ascension starts post-destruction of Nalanda and especially uh, through land grants given by Vallal Sena. So as late as late 18th century when William Jones, a very celebrated Indologist, visits Navadvipa, he writes in his journals that I come and see a flourishing university town here with uh, 1,500 scholars and 5,000 pupils all stuck studying gratuitously. So um, uh, Shobhiji should not worry for any financial model. The local society, we should recreate the local society in such a way that they should be able to support educational enterprises. And uh, who was studying in Navadvipa? Uh, 1,500 scholars. Each scholar's house is a college. Three to five pupils in his college, clothed and fed. It. They are fed there, and they come from all across the country. They are Okay, and later we will find the Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu when he graduates, he establishes his toll. This is before he becomes Sri Chaitanya. But what we gloss over always that Sri Chaitanya is a great political strategist. We modern Bengalis are guilty of defaming him. We have made a Naka Chaitanya out of this alpha male. If you understand Bengali, you will know how horribly uh, we have defamed him. So what he was doing at a time when Mughal rule, uh, sorry, Islamic rule was at its epoch with bloody power, 
he was negotiating. He was negotiating with Prataparudra, he was negotiating with Vijayanagara, he was negotiating with uh, Hussain Shah. Okay? And this negotiation slowly builds a picture that, you see, we can't blame people. The historical times were very different, but this negotiation was important. And this negotiation, obviously, is the result why we have the birth of a new literature, new culture, Gaudiya Vaishnavism. We have Vrindavan, not very far from here. Huh? And we have the revival of Bengali society and religio-cultural fortunes because of Sri Chaitanya and the negotiations he successfully conducted. You have Govindev Temple. So, continuation of Islamic rule, but as my teacher always used to tell me that we were never keeping, our ancestors were never keeping quiet. We were always rebelling. So one region after another were in rebellion against others. I would name one or two people here. Maharaja Prataparitra during Akbar's reign. And you know, uh, there is a poem by Rai Gunakar, Bharat Chandra Rai, where he is mentioning that Maharaj Prataparitta Bangaj Kayastha, he is a Kayastha of Bengal, and Bahanno Hajar Tadhali, 52,000 infantry he is leading. He is not a king not to be reckoned with, and that's why the Mughals had to send no other than Maharaja Man Singh to subdue him. And then another person whom I should name today is Maharaja Krishna Chandra. Though we have this habit of calling that uh, the Battle of Plassey, 1757 is the first battle of independence. I would say it was not a first battle of independence. It was a coming together of local Hindu potentates to fight a notorious tormentor Sirajuddaula in that they sought help of the British East India Company. Now that's a debatable thing, but Maharaja Krishna Chandra, not as big as Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, certainly not, but in his own way, he also carries this tradition of cultural revival in a great way. He was a contemporary of Alivardi Siraj and Mir Qasim, and he was jailed a couple of times. Then you have the coming off of the Europeans, and in the coming off of the Europeans, what happened? The Dutch come at Sri Rampur. It is actually Sri Rampur. Uh, the French come at Chader Nagar. It becomes uh, Chader Nagar. The English come at Shoptogram. Shoptogram becomes Chittagong, and Kali Kota, Kali's Kota, becomes Calcutta. So the British conquest of Bengal, you have the second colonization, economic loot and plunder, famines and epidemics. I give you a small example. You have a famine in Bengal between 1769 and 1773, undivided Bengal, where a third of Bengal's population perishes. So this is the result of your British loot and plunder and obviously the despoliation and defaming of Bengal. So Bengal in the 19th century, though we have the Bengal Renaissance and the Brahma Samaj movement, the actual Bengal Renaissance is actually starting with Sri Chaitanya, not here. Uh, that's my thesis. Uh, there may be disagreements on that, because I see with Raja Ramohan Rai, there is no revival of things Indian, things Hindu. In fact, Ramon Rai could be held today for the death of Sanskrit in the Bengal region. Then, the Brahmo Samaj movement is checkmated by the arrival of Gadadhar Chattopadhyay. And Gadadhar Chattopadhyay's transformation into Sri Ramakrishna Paramahamsa. Had Sri Ramakrishna not been there in Bengal, then it would have been very difficult for the freedom movement, at least from the Bengal angle, to take shape. And without Sri Ramakrishna, we cannot think of a Swami Vivekananda. Without Swami Vivekananda, we cannot think of Sri Aurobindo or Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose. The struggle for political emancipation, uh, I'll just rush through here. Uh, we have Bankim, and it starts with Bande Mazaram, Twam Hi Durga, Dasha Praharana Dharini, Tomari Pratima Gadi Mandre Mandre, and Ravindranath, our Swadeshi Swamaj. We conveniently forget to read these beautiful essays. Uh, uh, Ravindranath's essays are not taught in our classrooms. We should bring them back 
and see what this man has written on nationalism, on Indian society, and he on history. History of Bharat Varsha, there is an essay by him. And Sri Aurobindo and the rebirth of Bengal revolutionaries. So Bengal, uh, Sri Aurobindo, I am tempted to make a remark here. When in the Jugantara Anushinal Samiti, they used to take the oath of sacrifice, then they used to hold the sword in one hand and the Bhagavad Gita on the other hand. And that's how they used to take the oath. So I'll uh, quickly rush through this portion. Uh, just uh, divided Bengal, India's partition, and a continued Hindu Holocaust. Perhaps what happened to an undivided Bengal between 1905 and 1971, and even later, is the story of what happens to a territory, to its people, to its economy, to its age-old socio-cultural system, and thus to its society in general when the area gets politically divided. Perhaps one needs to understand the dynamics of the forces which were unleashed by one such emotionally divisive and politically charged, even during an early phase of a divide and rule experiment conducted by an imperial polity within a colonized nation. Though this telling is focused on Bengal, it is also a sordid story of what happened to the sixth largest linguistic group of the world, living in one of the most densely populated places on the planet. Linguistically and culturally homogeneous, this terrain was incidentally also one extremely divided in faith and religion, as we have seen before. The effects of the partition of our nation, whether in its west or in the east, affected not only specific locations, but were spread out across the length and breadth of the country. Going beyond state-specific analysis of the fractured uh, reconfiguration of the Indian subcontinent, the exodus of Hindus from East Pakistan and later uh, from Bangladesh is the story of the uprooting of native soil-bound peoples who were rendered homeless, stateless, and disenfranchised of their ancestral cultures, their very civilizational roots and moorings. It is a story of the tragic exodus of millions, of an immense betrayal of humanity. The story of the partition of Indian subcontinent in the East is intertwined with the reality of atrocious human rights violations in the erstwhile East Bengal, Pakistan region, which was later to become Bangladesh. This is a chilling narrative, the details of which can only be reconstructed through a study of well-researched books and written documents, supplemented by readings of oral histories founded on interviews and testimonies. Knowledge often advances controversies but the hallmark of secularism is the creation of a truthful record which goes beyond the suppression of facts and figures, however unpalatable they may be. This is why the story of the Hindu Holocaust that happened in Bengal during the partition needs to be recorded in all its sordidness for our future memory. I would like to end uh, with a shloka from Saptasati Devi Mahatmyam praying for the success of endeavors like this and praying for the well-being of all of us sarva vadha vinirmukto dhanadhanya sutanvita manushyo mat prasadena bhavishyati na samsaya thank you Thank you so much, thank you so much. The resilience of Bengal spirit is seen in, he would not like it, but I'm going to say in people like Dr. Subrutoshi, Gangopadhyay, that's what that is. So when they were talking about it, I realized that. But yes, that spirit, that indomitable spirit of Bengal is inspiring. Uh, we're now moving on to, yes, yes. Did we, did we honor him? Yeah, yeah, where is he? You're going to start him up? Okay, you're going to put on the PowerPoint or just talk? One PowerPoint. One PowerPoint, okay. It's in my mail. Okay, hurry up. Oh, it's in your mail, is it? Yeah. Okay, it might take some right? Do you, you want to set up in the mail? In? It's in my mail. Log it, log it, log it. How do I log it? 
I don't know if you can see if you can.